new videos every day. Life, wisdom. So one of the most common mental disorders is bipolar. And now recently there's a bipolar two, some other classifications. Can you just discuss briefly maybe the history of bipolar and what your you know current observation of this disorder is? Sure. Well, as a diagnosis, it goes back roughly about 100 years, and it's gone through a few name changes. So in the DSM-3, it was manic depressive illness, and it was in the category of affective disorders. Affect is your feelings, basically. And then in, it was uh, DSM-3, yeah, DSM-4, 1994, it became bipolar mood disorder, and it was in the mood disorder section. So the affective disorders became the mood disorders. And I never really quite comprehended the purpose of that name change. But now in DSM-5, we don't have affective disorders or mood disorders. We've got depression disorders and bipolar is its own section. And it's no longer bipolar mood disorder. It's just bipolar disorder. So the names have been changing a lot, which hasn't had any effect on treatment, hadn't had any effect on anything. And the symptoms are basically the same. So... Bipolar, by definition, has two poles, up and down. So up is when you go into mania, and mild mania is called hypomania. And so if you're bipolar 1, that's where you go up into full mania. If you're bipolar 2, that's where you go into mild mania or hypomania. And if you're unipolar, in the old terminology, you only go down into depression. Uh, and so mania, like anything in life in general, in, in the DSM, there can be a very classical, crystal clear, really extreme case that's very nicely defined and obviously is different from normal moods and up and down. Mm -hmm. And so when the person's in the depressed phase, uh, symptoms include the depressed mood, which is really, 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 really depressed for weeks, months at a time with hardly any relief. Your energy level is very low. Often you'll lose 10, 20, 30 pounds. Your sleep is disturbed, so usually you're sleeping a lot less. You can't get to sleep. Quality of sleep is lousy. Wake up early, can't get back to sleep. Then you're more tired. Um, you get a very, you, your blinkers are like this, and all you see is the negative and the bad. And you kind of lose track of mm -hmm. positive things about yourself, about your life, about the world. So very depressed, negative, gloomy, hopeless outlook on the future. Um suicidal ideation, suicide attempts, and completing suicide. So you can't say that somebody got really, really depressed and they killed themselves, and that's just normal ups and downs. And then the mania is the same thing. If you're, here's the so-called middle normal, which is hard to define. You just go up a little bit or you just go down a little bit. We're just in normal mood fluctuation. And then you get into hypomania, which is kind of high end of normal moods, hard to tell. But when you get into kind of solid hypomania, it's starting to get a little more clear. But when you get to a full manic episode, the person will often say, and the loved one observes, uh, woke up one morning and they were going into mania. And by the end of the day, they were in it full. And that was you know, January 2nd. And on January 19th, they crashed. And within 24 hours, they were profoundly depressed. So it can be very clearly time limited. And the symptoms would include sort of the opposite of depression. Tons and tons and tons of energy, not sleeping very much, but no fatigue whatsoever. Thoughts going fast, moving around, lots and lots of grandiose plans about all kinds of things you're going to do, all kinds of projects going, uh, talking fast. Sometimes there's a lot of humor, uh, making jokes, rhymes, and funny rhymes and funny associations and then they get looser and looser and looser to the point where you can't even follow what the person's talking about uh, tremendous hilarity your sex drive can be really up um, I remember uh, first day of clinical rotations in medical school somebody randomly got assigned to psychiatry as their first rotation and on the very first day they met a woman who was manic who had bought three grand pianos on the same day so that's not normal shopping Mm. And it can be extremely self-destructive and dangerous. So that's the extreme clear. And if you have extreme clear bipolar, you do need some help with that. 
there's growing evidence about cognitive therapy being helpful for bipolar, not as much evidence as for just straight depression. Mm -hmm. um, the question then though is what kind of meds, for how long, what kind of doses, but if you're really, really severe bipolar, probably 999 psychiatrists of a thousand are going to say you need to be on meds. And it's hard to find a therapist who can claim to cure bipolar just with psychotherapy. But now let's scale down to not so clear. And let's talk about misuse of the label of bipolar. Can I just quickly, before we, before we kind of move off, mm. one of the things you mentioned a couple of times while you were discussing this bipolar disorder uh, was the issue of sleep and mm -hmm. that when they're depressed, they're not sleeping well, they can't sleep effectively, but then when they're manic, they're also not sleeping well, they don't experience the fatigue necessarily. Um, so, you know, the only reason I bring it up is because couldn't a potential uh, treatment modality be just addressing improving the person's sleep? I mean, wouldn't that arguably have some effect if that's such a, a pronounced, you know, part of the, you know, symptoms? Uh, yes, I know. So all treatments for either extreme mania or extreme depression include treatment for the sleep disturbance because it's all part of the package that you're treating. So I think the way to reframe the question would be if you had somebody who was deeply depressed and you just gave them sleeping medication and all that improved with their, was their sleep, would the rest of the depression go away? That's not really good evidence. But the problem is that all the antidepressant meds, they kind of target the whole package. You can't just, we're just going to treat maybe the appetite. We're going to give an appetite stimulant. Well, that's not going to treat the rest of the depression that okay. well, maybe, but maybe it will. So the literature on picking out single symptoms and then the whole rest of the package improves isn't really there. Okay. But there is an old literature on um, amphetamines for depression claiming that there's good benefits, which are going to improve your energy, improve your appetite, but ought to make your sleep worse. Um, so it's a, as always in psychiatry, it's kind of a contradictory, complicated, confused situation. Um, but coming back to bipolar, uh, there's all kinds of different treatments. There's people who recommend this, that, this, that, and this and that. But in terms of actual data and actual large studies, it's always just the drug companies that have the budgets to do the studies. Exactly. And uh, for depression just by itself, when you take all the studies and add them together, which this has been published, um, really the gap between the antidepressant and the placebo is pretty small, if anything. And that's true for antipsychotics and true for anti-manic mood stabilizer drugs. The big problem is they don't work all that well. And they don't work all that much better than placebo. Very interesting. But what I see, <clears throat> the actual work I do day in and day out is kind of three subgroups. Well, first of all, I see people have never got the bipolar label whatsoever. But with people who have the bipolar label, they kind of fall into three groups. Mm -hmm. And this label is way overused these days. So you can go see a psychiatrist, get called bipolar very easily now compared to 20 years ago. So one group is people where it's just clearly somebody's thrown that label on them and it doesn't really apply. It's just a mistake. And then there's a group in the middle where it's kind of, well, I could see why somebody would call, call that bipolar, but is it more borderline symptoms or is it more dissociative symptoms or it's got to do with some street drug use or Maybe there's some ADHD thrown in there and trying to sort all this out. Complicated mess. And then there's some people who give you this clear classical bipolar history, along with all their trauma conflicts and trauma-related feelings. And uh, the way it works out at a practical level is, if it's clearly a mistaken label, you just kind of take it away and problem solve. And hopefully they haven't already had their life completely changed by the medications they were given. Right, but most of the time they're given medications that sort of fit for their other symptoms even when you take the label off. So changing the labels doesn't really affect the medications that much is another strange thing. But basically, if you get into a recovery process, people are just going to stop talking about whether you're bipolar or not, and it's just going to fade out for one group. For another group, you're going to have to wait and see, and does the reasons to put the bipolar label on just kind of stay? Or 
do those reasons fade out? And you don't know up front. You can't make an educated guess. Mm -hmm. You have to see how it works out during the recovery process. And then there's another group where the, the prediction, the guess is, most likely after you finish all your trauma-related recovery, there's going to be some element of this bipolar left. It may be milder. It might go away, but I'm probably not going to bet on that. So the bets kind of shift away from the bipolar will melt away with the rest of the recovery. Mm -hmm. And that's really all anybody knows at the present time. So in terms of the frequency of, of mislabeling or inappropriately labeling, you kind of mentioned these, these three different kind of groups of people who could potentially receive this label. How does that break down in terms of how common is this, is this really extreme kind of bipolar situation that you described where it's very clearly observable that they're having, you know, extremely extreme uh, changes in mood? Well, if you go to the world in general, the general population, ballparkish, the, gener the figure is about 1% of people will meet criteria for bipolar sometime in their life. That's how common it is out in the world. But that includes a small number of people with the extreme clear and a lot of people with milder variations on that. So the number of people who've got the crystal clear kind of extreme version, not exactly known, but it's under 1%. It's probably maybe a tenth of 1% or half of 1% or something in that kind of general ballpark. So it's not real common. In terms of people who are in the mental health field, what I see is by far the biggest group is clear mislabel or at best pretty iffy label that it's kind of arbitrary. And the, the clear classical group would be the minority. Mm -hmm. Like I'd say maybe like 10% of people who have a bipolar label these days. So you think that perhaps 10% of people who have a bipolar label actually do have, you know, this classic kind of extreme case of what could clearly be called bipolar disorder. Right. That's just based on, you know, those people that I happen to see and work with. But that also fits with the literature that I had mentioned in another video. The clear evidence in the literature is that if you take 100 kids who have the label of bipolar, as adults, only 10% of them will still fit the label. So clearly, it's a either it's a mislabel or bipolar is something that people recover from on their own as they grow out of it. Right. So, I mean, it's not just my personal opinion. The literature supports this widespread mislabeling. There was an interesting study back... Uh, in the, either in the late 60s or in the 70s, where they had 100 patients uh, with videotaped interviews, and they got a whole group of American psychiatrists to diagnose them and a whole bunch of British psychiatrists to diagnose them. And back then, American psychiatrists were over-diagnosing schizophrenia, undiagnosing bipolar, and flip opposite in England. So the same group of 100 patients. In England, two-thirds of them were bipolar, one-third schizophrenic. But in America, two-thirds were schizophrenic, one-third bipolar. Hmm. But it's the same patients. And uh, America's kind of flipped over plus a bunch uh, going into the 90s and now in the 21st century that bipolar is the overused diagnosis. So you've done a great deal of research about trauma and specifically childhood trauma or sexual abuse and things like that and how those things will affect someone's mental health later in life. Um, could you make a statement regarding how much does childhood trauma or childhood sexual abuse um, correlate to somebody experiencing the diagnostic criteria of bipolar, potentially receiving that diagnosis later? You know, does trauma play a role in bipolar? Uh, well, if you want my personal opinion, it is. It it does play a role, not in all cases, but a lot. But in terms of actual literature. There's really not much research so far. There's a lot of research showing that rates of childhood, physical abuse, sexual abuse, family violence, and so on, are much elevated in depression. And it says that in the DSM-5, that childhood sexual abuse is a potent risk factor for depression. Understandably. And schizophrenia, funnily enough, there's uh, in the last 10 years, uh, increasing and now substantial literature showing childhood sexual abuse in particular, childhood trauma, including bullying, uh, dramatically increases your risk for psychosis. Mm -hmm. So that actually is not just my personal opinion anymore. I'm thinking the same will be true of bipolar, but we don't really have the literature yet. And isn't a large reason that they're 
isn't literature about that, that there's not really a, you know, number one, a group of people studying trauma who have the money to do research on it, but then also that there's not really a financial incentive to, you know, you know, obviously, <laughs> you know, when we're looking at most of these mental health studies, they're funded by a pharmaceutical company who has a financial motivation to study these drugs and look at the effects of these drugs where they don't really have the financial motivation to look at how trauma would affect someone's mental health. Well, that's true because these various antipsychotic, antidepressant, mood stabilizer drugs, we're talking about multi-billions of dollars per year revenue mm -hmm. for one drug, not put them all together. It's tens right. of billions. Right. But nevertheless, in the last 10 years, we've got further ahead on relationship between trauma and psychosis than trauma and bipolar. Okay. It seems like the you know the entrenched resistance to we're going to hang on to bipolar has nothing to do with your life experience and really just a brain disease is even stronger now than it is for schizophrenia. And is there hope for recovering from bipolar disorder? I mean you mentioned that perhaps 90% of people who've received this diagnosis were actually you know, mislabeled or were kind of haphazardly given that diagnosis when it really didn't fit. You know, what is uh, the hope for recovery for somebody who has received a bipolar diagnosis and who has potentially gone under undergone medication uh, for that diagnosis? Well, again, the literature is not totally conclusive, but there's a literature suggesting pretty strongly that if you have bipolar disorder, prescribing antidepressants actually makes it worse and speeds up the relapse, which could also be true for depression in and of itself. Um, so it's not crystal clear that the meds help with the prognosis long, long, long term. Um, basically, we just don't have enough knowledge for me to be able to say definitively, for sure, if you have a classical bipolar, it's been cycling for a decade now, here's your chances of recovery mm -hmm. in terms of it melts away. I just don't have the information base to say that. If you have more of the, mm, it's not crystal clear, it could be this, it could be that. My clinical experience tells me that there's serious hope for recovery. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to give false hope that isn't based on any kind of experience or literature. But I can give real hope, I think, for a large chunk of people. Certainly. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Ross. You're welcome. Thank you for spending your time watching this video. I do hope that you found it interesting and that you will leave me your comments letting us know your thoughts on this matter. Please be sure to subscribe to the Psyche Truth channel so you can see all of our future videos. I look forward to seeing you again soon. In the meantime, I'm Psyche Truth correspondent Karina Rachel, and I thank you for watching.